Hello, and welcome back to Torment Tides of Numenera. So, when we last left off, we were still poking around at this whole, like, Lost Stitches thing, or whatever it was called. Uh, hidden Enemy. So, the problem is, I don't know how to finish this, because our Lord Wunkin here apparently went and found the Stitches and brought it in to make some point, I don't know. Uh, I guess there's many reasons. It's always convenient to have an enemy that you can rally people against without actually having it be dangerous in order to make yourself look important or to consolidate power or whatever. That's just authoritarianism 101. But even though I know this, he kind of scoffed it and he was like, ha, even if that were true, you don't have any evidence. Which makes me think that if I could find some evidence, maybe I could convince the other people not sure. The thing is, I didn't see any particular, um, um, good lord, I just lost track of what I was saying. Oh, I haven't seen any particular conversation options that suggest that maybe that's a route I could go. I guess I could talk to the kids again. I'm just going to poke around one more time, then I'm going to shrug and give it up. I don't want to attack it. I don't want to turn it over. I guess I'm just going to ignore it. No, nope, nothing for you to say. All right. Let's go. One last look, and then I guess we'll just continue doing something else. And that's fine, it just kind of bugs me that apparently all the other options are closed off. So, is there anyone that I could talk to that looks special over here? Mercenaries? Another nano? What are these doing? Cultist. Let's just poke at these people super quick. Nah. Nah. Alright. Well, okay. So what else are we doing otherwise? So we're going to forget about this guy for right now. Just make sure that nothing appeared here on here. Alright. So we still need to found... See if we can find Percy Eye's whereabouts. Maybe. I'm not totally sure I care about that. Obviously we need to track down this murderer. Very strange. But I think that we're going to do so by going back and we're going to talk to the mapper. And then hopefully he has something useful for us to you know, to go on there as a lead. I never did talk to, like, our Kung Fu Master over here. Should I do that? Um, yeah, sure, let's see what he has to do. The large muscled man is practicing some form of martial art as you look on. He is wearing an old, white, rough woven coat with the sleeves torn off, and a red bandana is wrapped tightly around his head. He seems to be moving much faster than his size suggests is possible. He glides between stances as swiftly as water. His fists are blurring hammers, striking at invisible enemies. His bare, calloused feet snap and slash at the air like knives. Where did you learn to fight like that? By challenging the deadliest creatures and studying their killing blows, he says. I lack claws or teeth, but I do the best I can. Well, you're very fast. Yes, Aiden says. The Drebbel's gift. His hand slips around an invisible assailant's arm. He snaps it with the stab of his elbow, then crushes his enemy's throat and flips him over his shoulder to the ground. Jacintha Murray, he shouts, spinning over the invisible adversary's corpse to deliver a triangle of jabs to the chest of his next attacker. The whole set of moves took more than four seconds. He catches you staring and smiles. You must be wondering why I'm shouting. Well, yes. I'm not surprised. I must look like a lunatic. Uh-huh. Before spearing his opponent's jugular with three fingers. Canted thrust. It helps me focus my breathing, my strength and will. It reminds me how weak I once was and how strong I've become. Ooh, your kung fu is strong. Years ago, I was a starving beggar. I managed to steal a wedge of pie crust and was terrified that someone else would take it from me. So I hid inside that metal structure over there to enjoy my feast. Bite of the hidden quab, he says, clawing his enemy's eyes. The stale crust crumbled into pieces between my e eager fingers. And something strange happened. They drifted towards the ground like the softest of snowflakes. I was able to pluck each one out of the air before they fell. At first, I was delighted. Then I wept. How far had I fallen that clean food was a miracle, he sighs, then delivers four more blows into the air's belly. But the miracle never ended. The longer I lived in that shelter, the more I could slow the world by concentrating. I swore I would never waste this gift. I would honor it by becoming stronger, faster. We can rebuild him. I would challenge the predators of the world and take their killing blows from them. I would never be prey again. Grudge stop. Huh. Well, that's cool. Good for you. Which metal structure is he talking about, I wonder? Did I go in this one? What was in here? Fine. 
I can't remember, so let's just go stick our head in real quick. Or wait, I guess I can I'm just ready. look at... I'm always ready. Oh, Fifth Eye Tavern. I haven't been there at all. Well, all right. hello. How did I miss a tavern? Honestly. Walk past a tavern. What kind of a jerk. It's oddly blurry in here. Okay. Wow. Neat. Uh, where to start? Here, you're in the front. Hey, Clarion. This young woman wears finely polished armor and paces back and forth restlessly on the walkway. Her long hair is lustrous and healthy, and her whole form exudes a wholesome vitality. When she sees you, she raises her voice in greeting. Welcome, friend, to the fifth eye. She strides closer to speak more softly. You come at an exciting time. I've been trying to convince some veteran warriors of their eminent suitability to join the endless battle. So far, they've rebuffed me, but perhaps you can succeed where I have failed. So, what is this endless battle? Much as it sounds, she says. It stemmed from a rift between the changing god and one of his offspring, and has endured for hundreds of years. Raging over the same battlefields, using the deadliest technology of the ancients, the landscape is scarred and pitted beyond recognition. The walls between dimensions are thin there. Every day, horrors cross into our world. She stands, arms akimbo. Worse, in recent years, the struggle has expanded. Nearby settlements, founded to provide material for the combatants, or existing there long before the two sides came to rage on their borders, have been engulfed by the spreading chaos. She frowns. It's not too late to change the course of the battle. If only warriors of proven metal would join the fight. That is why I am here. That is why I beg for yourself. For your help. What? Okay. So, who are you? I am Clarion. I seek strong warriors, brave souls, to fight in the endless battle, to hold back the advance of the enemy. So, which side exactly are you recruiting for? Oh, the Changing Gods. He's always been the patron of Sagas Cliffs. Perhaps we would not exist if not for his lives and his castoffs. Certainly we would not be as we are. She pauses. But that is not the only reason. The Changing Gods' forces have allied with the towns and villages of the Rexulian Waste. We seek to... Phyrexulian? Sure. We seek to prevent the endless battle from expanding beyond its borders, growing in size once again. The enemy has attempted to sweep across the plain before. They tricked the Changing God's allies centuries ago, destroyed an army of sand knights, and took half its settlements in the waste. We won't let them do that again. So who is this enemy that you're fighting? The armies of the first cast-off? Really? They have never been friends to the people of Sagas Cliffs, she frowns. The first cast-off is long dead, but her forces still hold a grudge against her sire and his patron city. The first cast-off? Really? That's interesting. So is that his original body, then? Or the first one that he made? I wonder. So who are these veterans you want me to recruit? They have fought in countless battles and emerged victorious. They have made decisive forays that turned entire wars. They are clever and thoughtful, though I know only their reputation. The third inversion, for instance, saw them reach into a new dimension and, well, I won't bore you with the details, but they are integral in a defense that would have changed the course of that conflict. I, I would like to hear about you reaching into new dimensions. So why are you trying to recruit these guys? Maybe they're tired of war. She shakes her head. Conflict shapes us all. It sharpens us, makes us stronger than we ever thought we could be. If you hide from it, you'll never know what you could become. Or worse, you'll be easy prey for those who are stronger or crueler than you. She clutches her shoulders. These veterans have, growing, have grown tired and complacent. I want to help them recapture what they lost. No, I want to make them even greater than they were. Um, if I help you, do I get a reward? Of course, I am not a wealthy woman, but I have allies in the city who are. The more veterans you convince to join the battle, the more you will be paid. Um, I, I guess, I don't like taking sides in a conflict I know almost nothing about. I mean, okay, yeah, so it's a cast-off versus the Changing Gods people, but using self-descriptors is not a great thing. Plus, all I'm hearing this from is from one side. The other side might say, like, we're the true heirs of the Changing God, and these people just claimed his name and whatever, but I don't know. I'll, I'll think about this. Let's go talk to some other people. Trust I don't want to just... Honesty are our bonds jump into things here. Wow, there's a whole bunch of people here. 
These fluids are pumping, these pipes are pumping fluids from somewhere outside the bar. Someone added the spigots later, so the fluids probably weren't intended for drinking. <laughs> you can hear liquids coursing through these ancient pipes. The whole building seems to predate the Ninth World. That's interesting. This booth was once a metal tank that held some kind of liquid. An odd lilting song occasionally rises from this machine, as if a musician is trapped inside. Okay, well that's not weird. Yep, another metal tank, right. It's numerous, a ghostly woman. Oh, I know where we're going first. Obviously. I'm ready. Well, actually, let's talk I'm to the bartender. That's just polite, right? Feriok. The bartender is a tall, powerfully built man with nut brown skin and a bushy beard. He radiates strength and confidence. He moves with speed when necessary, and remains almost motionless the rest of the time, like a predator waiting to leap, with his cat-like reflexes. Yet even when he prepares a drink, he doesn't touch a thing. His brow furls slightly, and the glasses and bottles lift by themselves. Cool. When he sees you, he smiles broadly. Welcome to the fifth eye, friend. I'm Feriak. So what can you tell me about this place? The fifth eye is a bar for psychics. At least it is now. In the prior worlds, near as we can tell, it was an old pumping station. All these pipes lead down to some reservoirs deep beneath the city, and they pump whatever's in the reservoirs up here. He laughs. Anyway, some damn fools started drinking from the pipes, and some other fools started in two. Some of them died, some of them got drunk as hell. After a few whiles, vague enough for ya, they got pretty good at figuring out what was safe and which weren't. That's when they figure out they'd start making money off the place. The reason psychics flock here is because the building dampens out the psychic noise of the city. He grins. The drinks help, too. Interesting. Feriak means to say that he is only involved in the delivery of these drinks, rather than their creation. Given his skills, it's only right and proper. He throws a hand across his forehead. I have been maligned by this desert-dwelling inter interloper. That's weird. You said this is a bar for psychics? What does that mean? They just hang out here? It means this is a place where psychics can unwind. Get away from the city. Get away from the noise. You know what it's like to be psychic? Well, no. Let me paint a picture. Imagine every time you're going to sleep, someone comes in and starts screaming in your ear. Ah, uh, yeah, I remember having kids. Or objects in the room start whispering about how they want you to burn. Yep. Uh, yep, I had kids. Or they might tell you their secret names and how to make them float and dance at your command. Oh, I missed that one. That would have been cool. Or maybe every person you meet is like a house with all its doors and windows thrown open, and you can't help but look in to plunder their secrets. And underneath it all, you hear their silent judgments, the truths they even hide from themselves. So I wonder if we had picked, um, at the very beginning we had the choice to pick up the psychic skill to read people's surface thoughts, if that would have yielded us a different set of conversations here. That's interesting. Well, we'll never know. He pauses to concentrate on a floating cloth as it wipes a mug clean. Then the mug places itself on a rack. Folks think that it's a blessing to have these powers, and sometimes it really is, especially when you can join your friends to make something great. But... Yeah, he shrugs. It can be hard, hateful, and you can never tell when you're going over the edge of insanity. Interesting. I'd like a drink. I like drinks. You're in for a treat, friend. A real treat. Assuming you call the possibility of toxic reaction a treat, of course. Yeah, sure. He points at the various pipes on the wall. We've positively identified some of these as, well, safe. Smaller subset here are inebriants or hallucinogens. We've got a few that are, well, chancy. As in, sometimes they kill people. So, what do you mean by chancy? Oh, we've got this strange black ichor. Thick enough it's almost chewy. There's a pink sludge that's a noon... Thanogen, but its strength varies and sometimes it kills people. Okay, hold on, that's another word I'm going to look up between episodes. After finding Cargical. Let's see here. E-N-T-H-E-O-G-E-N. -E -E if I knew how to pause recordings, I would go look these up, but alas... All right, but its strength varies, and sometimes it kills people. We have one that smells like a Latibon fruit, and we sometimes use that one to get rid of stubborn grease stacks. It's acidic, but, well, maybe it's an acquired taste. You know, I kind of wonder. I was going to go get at least one more augment, um, the blood one, to prevent against poisoning and stuff. L let's, let's go do that, actually, and then I'll experiment a little. I don't think I was interested in the rest of the augments. They're things like Wolverine Claws or Punches or whatever. 
Um, I already got the Numenera one, and I got the eye, and now because of the eye and the... Oh wait, did I get the eye? No, maybe I just got... Was that the Numenera that I'm carrying around? The artifact? Yeah, so I'm already maxed out of perception. So... Oh, I'm not! Plus one to perception. Was I using something else that gave me perception? Oh, okay. We're getting a couple then. Frankly, I see no downside to upgrades. Let's go. I always like the Cybermen. So, let's... I don't know. I got 700 cash. Let's do a few more. Hello, Jordan. You're back! Can I interest you in any of my vastly overpriced items and service? Yes. Yes, you can. It's going to bug me that I'm never going to know what the encroaching darkness is. But <laughs> even the question is evocative. I can't get it out of my head. Ugh. So what are the blood nanites? Just to make sure. Fight illnesses and toxins in your bloodstream. 95 shins. All right, let's do it. Things really do start quite calmly. The drones inject you several times. This is awful. Ah. The drones inject you several times and withdraw to a respectful distance. You breathe. The air seems tinged like with the sunset's light. Then, you feel the first bite. The machines swarm through you like a metal wave, nipping and tearing, devouring flesh, muscle, and organs. You open your mouth to scream, and they pour out in a gleaming flood. Eventually, the machines learn that you are not food. At some point during the operation, you fell. Now you rise, panting. Don't you look healthy, Jaranoff proclaims. Well, you're covered in your own blood, but you clearly have more. So, anything else? Uh, so let's take a look at this item. Or the ability, I'm sorry. Blood Nanites. Grants immunity the most to most damage per round. Oh, neat. See, these are so great. Like, why would I not spend money on these? These are awesome. So we can afford the eyeball, too. Let's go ahead and do that. I'm probably going to regret this, but I'd like to consider getting the artificial eyeball. You won't regret it. Well, you might during the procedure, but after, you won't regret it. Okay, I'll take it. These sound effects are awful. A drone holds your head mercilessly rigid while another approaches, claws outstretched. Block. Your head is screaming at you, and you're pretty sure you're screaming back. A third drone, a gleaming blur behind the pane, approaches with a new eye gently clasped in its claw. Schluck. You. The drones release you, groaning and clutching at your head. You feel the new eye squirming into your socket, connecting with nerves there. Then, the pain stops. You study your hand, noticing a scar on your hand that you've never seen before. Amazing, isn't it? Chernoff says. Are you in need of anything else? I, I think I'm good for right now. Okay, so now, get another one. Yes, plus one perception. So made of synthetic materials and loaded to the brim with advanced sensor technology, this device greatly enhances your visual acuity. It also has a slightly disconcerting propensity to reorientate it at random times, causing odd looks for passerbys. Neat. Okay, so now I maxed out of perception. This is great. Like, why would I not do this stuff? Well, that's a nice sentiment. I'm not sure I'd go that for all the time. But, uh, sure. Here we go. Alright, so, now that I'm slightly more protected against being poisoned, not, oh, there's Memoriva guys over there. Ooh. Maybe we'll chat with them, too. I don't know if I really feel like trying anything experimental. Maybe. Hello! I'd like a drink. Why are the experimental ones more money? The black ichor, the pink sludge, and the fruity grease cutter. Um. You know, I used to drink a lot of really thick stouts, so let's try the black ichor. Ugh. I tasted this stuff once. I don't remember much about the time afterward, but I was raving about holes in reality. Well, here's your drink. A strong glass bowl floats under a pipe. The spigot turns, and ichor oozes from it. You can smell it from here. The bowl floats back to you, all without Ferric touching it. Drink fast is my advice. You put the word to deed. The tinkle is not unpleasant, although the texture is horrifying, unbidden. You think of soft flesh rotting under a jungle sun. Nothing happens. Well, at least not right away. Just as you begin to doubt the ichor's efficiency, you feel the earth shift slightly. The walls shiver and begin to shake. Their surfaces look as though they are slowly melting. 
You feel the weight of the ceiling and the sky forcing you to the floor, and only a great effort of will keeps you standing. Rents begin to appear in the flat surfaces of the bar, in the walls. Scabrous tissue rims their edges, and a deathly chorus pipes through a register almost too high to hear. The world tilts on its axis, and you stagger to the right. Your vision blurs, and the invisible world swims into view, becoming more solid than the world you call home. Yay? Okay. Well, that might have been a plan. Let's go talk to the ghostly woman. Now that we're all full of crazy stuff. You draw closer, but the wispy form of the woman in the booth does not clarify. You can hardly discern the details of her ghostly face, and you hear a chorus of whispering female voices that swarm around here like chance moths. Study her a little more carefully. You peer more closely at her, and she takes no notice of you. Her features are those of a teenage woman leaving childhood behind. Your memory sparks faintly. These clothes look familiar to you. Wait, they're familiar because they were the fashion in Sagus Cliffs nine centuries ago, and your mind has dredged that association from its depths. How old am I? You have seen her face before somewhere in this city. The ghostly woman could be your twin. Really? See? New eye. Listen to the whispers. They are on the verge of compre comprehensibility, but they brush against your mind just below the level of conscious thought. You have a strong sense of vague longing, of loss that touches you and leaves you empty. Hello? She has been ignoring you, but without a transitional state, her face is suddenly and furiously focused on yours. Another flicker, and her hands wrap around your throat. Ghost or not, her fingers are very real, and they are choking the life for you. I'm not letting a ghost strangle me. Not dumb. Um, yeah, I'd really rather not be strangled to death. I'm just going to say, I have better ways to die. You manage to wrest her fingers from your throat, and you hurl her away. You come up in a crouch, ready for another attack, but she is looking away from you, as if that had never happened. Who are you? Then, in a flash, she is upon you, her fingers digging into your throat. Come on, lady, chill out. Using up my stat pools. Let's flip for this one. Oh, I think I failed. Uh-oh. Her fingers dig deeper. She's not just compressing your trachea. She's tearing your throat out. You choke and cough, drowning on your own blood. But she is latched inside you, and the last thing you see is her rage-twisted face. Can't. Can't well... Die. Seriously, I get killed by a ghost? Well, that's okay. That's new. Never died to a ghost before. Well, I don't think I might have. Hello. This looks an awful lot like our crossroads sanctuary. So, hey, what's up? It's the same ghostly woman who strangled you, but the fury is gone from her face, replaced with confusion. She looks around. Her gaze falls on the large machine and lingers there. Finally, she notices you. She steps forward, a hint of trepidation in her eyes. Where are we? Do you know? It kind of looks like the buried crossroads, a laboratory hidden underneath the city. A city? Sagas? She says this last word softly to herself. Why do I remember that name? She looks around her again. This place isn't under any city, though. I don't think we're in the real world at all. Wish I could remember more. <clears throat> I do remember one thing. She puts her hands to the sides of her head. I was angry, enraged. There are... <sighs> she turns on you. I, I don't know how. But there are women like me, born throughout the city, repeatedly, against their will. What do you mean? They are compelled into existence. She bites her lip, uncertain. Then she nods. I'm just a memory, but something is forcing my memory into the minds of women throughout the city. So you're the one that's talking over people. Updated my journal. She takes her hand she takes your hand in hers. It's wrong. I don't know how I know, but she looks away, lost in her own thoughts. When she turns back to you, there is more certainty in her voice. Find them. The women becoming like me, or already might like me. Maybe I'll remember more. Maybe, maybe we can do something. Look. You follow her finger to a glowing form where before there was nothing. It's a membra. You found one of them already. The woman created by the engine. The engine. Really? Okay, so how do I find them? They're in the real world in Sagus. You may have met them without realizing I have only... 
vague impressions of them. I know that one of them is a leader. She sacrificed much of her life and so gained life in return. She shakes her head as though to clear it. I'm sorry I can't tell you more than that. You have no more impressions? One of them offers joy and sorrow for coin. Her family is not her own. It's borrowed, I think. A leader who sacrificed much of her life. Sorry, I'm taking notes. These types of games require notes. Sacrificed. Okay. And who is the other one? Um, offers joy and sorrow. For coin. Borrowed family. Okay. <clears throat> I've talked to virtually everyone in the city. Oh, pardon me. <coughs> Although, that doesn't sound familiar. Um, either I'll figure it out, or you'll finally yell loud enough through the screen I'm that going. I can hear you. So what is this? The air is warm next to this machine, and you feel dizzy whenever you go near it. Oh, so I don't get to poke it, huh? Is there a way out of this? Ah, good. Portals. Okay, well, that's not an interesting direction to go. Okay, let's go talk to Syria. I've met so many people, I'm having a hard time keeping track of who these people are. Whoa. The siege, she says, watching the scene in front of you. I remember the siege when the Tabat came to destroy Sagas Cliffs. You remember it? That happened a long time ago. Did it? I'm only a broken memory, apparently. What do I know of time? A wry smile plays on her lips. These were the genocides people, right? Yeah. After a long, quiet moment, she nods as though coming to a decision. I was there. I remember the screams, the terror. The Tabat came, many of them mounted on their dragoliths, each of them with a stranger, more terrifying weapon than the one before. Sagas should have fallen, like Xianha and Yuka and a hundred villages before us. But it didn't. We fought them off. She shakes her head. But what does that have to do with the other women? I don't know. There's more to this story. I need to help you find it. <clears throat> Can I talk to any of you people? No. Tabat? Hello. Okay, so these people aren't interactable. This building, the building, the burning building, looks like homes you've seen in Sagas Cliffs, but of a much older style. This is all just a memory, but the heat from this rubble, as well as the smell of burning wood and flesh, seems very real. Blood-curdling moans can be heard from inside this structure, but there's no way in. Okay, so that's as far as we can go. Interesting. Yes. Okay, so we need to find more people. I wonder if the innkeeper is the one that was I'm offering... Going. No, Joy and Sorrow, that's not... That's not an innkeeper. Hmm. I may have to go scan through my old episodes, and I kind of don't want to. Ah! Hello! Am I glad you came out of that door? That thing just showed up. I didn't know what to expect. Do you know who the ghostly woman is in that fathom? He shakes his head. Don't know anything from that one. The way is blocked. He shrugs. It's not surprising, really. It's your mind, not mine. Most likely she's just a lacuna, a construct of your buried memories. Either that, or she's a reflection of someone you met in real life. Whoever or whatever she is, she probably isn't real. You're the only one with that distraction, or the, with that distinction. He chuckles to himself. And me, by extension. Do you have any suggestions about what I should do? Yeah, yeah, just Makina. Has anything changed since I was last here? Psh, you're super helpful. Alright, see you in a bit. So, I wonder if then this one's going to open a little later, too. That's interesting. Yes, now. Very interesting. And here's Surya. Yes, now. Interesting. I wish I could remember who I was speaking to. It was someone in the underbelly. 
gonna have to go back and check on that. I still wonder if that Icker did. If it changed anything around us. Um. Handy trick, that immortality thing of yours. Eh. It's alright. Um, so you guys can point out to me if I've missed something important. But I'm going to go ahead and take a break and go cough really hard somewhere around here. So thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.